Hi, and welcome to the Liberty Lounge. I want to start episode two of the Liberty Lounge by saying that this is a segment of the Western Canon podcast in which we review great books that focus on liberty and freedom. The idea here is to do both older texts and newer texts, to explore the underlying foundational philosophical ideas that underpin freedom, ordered liberty, and natural rights, and also to hopefully look at newer texts that also dive into the state of liberty and freedom in the West um, as it stands today. And speaking of West, in this episode, I am going to do part two of a review of Thomas G. West's book, The Political Theory of the American Founding. If you're new to this segment, you should first listen to episode one of the Liberty Lounge, in which I review the introduction and first chapter of West's book. Uh, West, if you'll remember, is a Hillsdale College professor, um, and he's really written a great book here. And so I would encourage you to go back and listen to episode one to get a sense of how West sets up his book. In this second episode, I'd like to do a review of chapters two and three of the book, which I'll then use as a jumping off point to talk about natural rights and also John Locke's second treatise of government, which as far as I'm concerned is the text that is most primary and foundational to the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and it just generally contains the first major elucidation of the ideas that undergird the canon of American liberty. So what I'll do is I'll start by continuing to review Thomas G. West's book, um, which again is called The Political Theory of the American Founding, and then we'll look at Locke's theories of natural rights and how governments emerge from a state of nature. And I've decided not to do a third episode on West's book, uh, mostly because when I'm done, no one will want to read his book as I've covered so much of it. And also because I think West's book, as brilliant of an achievement as it is, leaves a lot out. I mean, I'll be the first to admit, it's very possible that West leaves a lot of the foundational theory out because he assumes that anyone reading his book is already versed in these ideas, which they might be. That said, I'm not going to assume that of my potential listeners, mostly because I really don't know if students or even the common person is even being exposed to these ideas anymore. And as the U.S. government grows exponentially over the years, both in terms of its literal size and the scope of its powers, as we become accustomed to the growth of the regulatory state and the overreach of the executive branch of government, each generation coming up then becomes more and more estranged from and quite frankly boggled by these ideas regarding limited government, ordered liberty, natural rights, federalism, separation of powers, subsidiarity, uh, and free markets. In other words, we're in danger of forgetting the great creed of this creedal nation. And so this will be the second and final episode reviewing West's book. Um, at the end of this episode, I'll announce the next book up for review, which we'll tackle in episode three. So to get started, West opens chapter two of his book by arguing against scholars who see the founding philosophy as an amalgam of disparate traditions. Instead, West argues that the founding was guided primarily by the natural rights philosophy. He quotes Jefferson, who writes, Every species of government has its specific principles. Ours, perhaps, are more peculiar than those of any other in the universe. It is a composition of the freest principles of the English Constitution, with others derived from natural right and natural reason. Here West argues that essentially, even though many of our institutions and customs are of English origin, naturally as they would be, the founding philosophy modified and even threw out any elements of this tradition that stood in conflict with the quote, equal rights of the individual. According to Michael Zuckert, the founders saw the need to promote a, quote, rights infrastructure, in addition to the, quote, social institutions and traits of character that make rights securing possible. This fact supports West's notion that the founders did not separate rights from duties. Later in Chapter 2, West devotes several pages to a discussion of liberalism, distinguishing John Locke's classical liberalism, representing the founders' understanding of rights, from the post-1960s quote-unquote liberalism with which we're familiar today. Uh, no word has been more abused in the English language than the word liberal, probably. The post-1960s liberalism takes on a new view of rights and sees them essentially as rights to quote, equal concern and respect. And as philosopher Ronald Dworkin puts it, the right to quote, the same distribution of goods or opportunities. But, West writes, quote, 
This requires not only transfer of material benefits from the more advantaged to the less, but also, quote, the right to public esteem and respect for any manner of life, however degraded. Charles Taylor echoes this post-1960s conception of rights when he says that, quote, the withholding of recognition can be a form of oppression. So on this view, a philosophy of rights would tell people what they want and would also give people what they want. This is why West argues that, quote, in recent liberal theory, speech and publications that disparage or harm the self-esteem of the, quote, disadvantaged should be discouraged or punished. The post-1960s view of rights, according to West, is the positive rights agenda promoted by the administrations of both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. West writes, quote, Clinton's positive rights go beyond the founding and contradict it. And here West actually quotes Clinton. Human development must be part of our human rights agenda, says Clinton. And development means being, quote, free from the oppression of want, unquote. So that's some pretty amazing stuff there from a 2009 Hillary Clinton in her remarks on the human rights agenda for the 21st century. Political scientist Jennifer Nadelsky discusses this post-1960s understanding of liberalism, reaffirming West's point. She says, quote, Once we acknowledge that some basic rights can only be enjoyed with state economic support, we've left the boundary of the founder's negative liberty behind. And of course, further redistributive incursions on property are likely to follow. West elaborates on this point writing, and I'm going to read you a lengthy quote here because this is just put so perfectly, and it really echoes much of what we discussed last episode. West writes, quote, The founders did not think liberty includes a right to demand state economic support from others. Instead, natural rights are based on what human beings are and have by their nature, their life, liberty, and talents, which give them the ability to acquire property, worship God, and pursue happiness. Modern liberal rights are not natural rights because no one possesses food, transportation, respect, and access to medical care by nature, unquote. Although interestingly enough, I should point out, just note here quickly, West does believe that the founders' principles do lead to a very limited uh, right to some welfare. Uh, this is something he discusses in the final chapter of the book. You'll just have to buy the book to find out um, to what extent that applies. West rounds out his post-1960s section of the book with a discussion of the distinction between classical liberalism and modern welfare state liberalism. That's the type of liberalism uh, that we mean when we say it today, typically. He notes just how slippery and imprecise the word liberal is, considering that such disparate figures as Locke, Jefferson, Kant, Dewey, the Roosevelts, John Rawls, Ronald Dworkin, Obama, and the Clintons are all regularly called liberal. Okay, so on to the next chapter, chapter three. Chapter three is called Equality and Natural Rights Misunderstood. Here in chapter three, West discusses common misconceptions about equality and natural rights, starting with a question that has long been a concern uh, of Western thought, and that is, is there a conflict between equality and liberty? This question has been a central one in the West, going back to the ancient Greeks, but even modern political thinkers pose this question in the U.S. constitutional context. For example, political scientist Samuel Huntington suggests that liberty and equality are destined by their very nature to clash. The famous historian Joseph Ellis even makes this same error when he says that equality and liberty are, quote, mutually exclusive and, quote, contradictory. West says that although this sort of error is, quote, quite common, it can be easily avoided by reading the political documents of the American founding more carefully. He writes, quote, In the founders' understanding, equality as a political principle cannot conflict with liberty because equality and liberty mean the same thing. In other words, human beings, though they are born into different circumstances and possess different natural capacities, possess equal protection under the law and possess equal rights. One of the dangers of describing equality as something other than equality of rights, is echoed in a passage by Alexis de Tocqueville when he says of men, quote, that they want equality of freedom, but if they cannot get it, they will still want it in slavery. This is fascinating because it suggests the kind of utopian uh, material equality of outcome that Marxists describe, what de Tocqueville calls, quote, equality of conditions. 
At this point, continuing this discussion, West uh, then quotes an obscure founding figure, Nathaniel Chipman, who published the first American overview of the principles of political science in 1793. He agrees, West writes, that the notion of, quote, equality of property conflicts with equality in the sense of equal liberty. Equality of results, West posits, can be achieved only by coercion, by taking away the equal liberty of some by violence in order to make others quote-unquote equal. Chipman explains, quote, If we make equality of property necessary in a society, we must employ force against both the industrious and the indolent. On the one hand, the industrious must be restrained from every exertion which may exceed the power of inclination of common capacities. On the other hand, the indolent must be forcibly stimulated to common exertions, unquote. This sentiment is perhaps best articulated by James Wilson in his 1791 Lectures on Law, when he clarifies, quote, When we say that all men are equal, we mean not to apply this equality to their virtues, their talents, their dispositions, or their acquirements. In all these respects, there is, and it is fit for the great purposes of society, that there should be great inequality among men. That social happiness, which arises from the friendly intercourse of good offices, could not be enjoyed unless men were so framed and so disposed as mutually to afford and to stand in need of service and assistance. Hence the necessity not only of a great variety, but even of great inequality in the talents of men, bodily as well as mental. So this is a great quote because it emphasizes the fact that inequality in its various forms, in traits, in property, and in circumstance, is necessary for the division of labor. It is necessary for our human relations. It is necessary for the creation of new wealth with respect to trade and the establishment of of contracts that benefit not only one party, but both parties. Inequality is necessary for diversity and for social happiness. It is necessary for civilization. And again, we're not talking about inequality of rights here. We're talking about inequality of virtues, talents, dispositions, and acquirements, to use James Wilson's own words. It was Jefferson echoing this who believed that freedom, natural rights, and limited government were the best ways to produce natural hierarchies and meritocracies of competence. In a letter to John Adams many years after the Revolution, Jefferson writes, quote, I agree with you that there is a natural aristocracy among men. The grounds of this are virtue and talents. May we not even say that that form of government is the best which provides the most effectually for a pure selection of these natural aristoi into the offices of government? Unquote. David Ramsey, a South Carolina founder, essentially says that it is this very idea that makes America what we would now call exceptional. He writes, quote, It is the happiness of our present constitution that all offices lie open to men of merit, of whatever rank or condition, and that even the reins of the state may be held by the son of the poorest man, if possessed of the abilities equal to the important station. We are no more to look up for the blessings of government to hungry courtiers or the needy dependents of British nobility, but must educate our own children for these exalted purposes." John Adams echoed Jefferson's sentiment as well, stating, quote, Nature has ordained that no two creatures shall be perfectly equal. Although among men, all are subject by nature to equal laws of morality, and in society have a right to equal laws for their government, yet no two men are perfectly equal in person, property, understanding, activity, and virtue, or ever can be made so by any power less than that which created them. This Adams quote today reads like it was intended to be a warning, an ominous prediction, and a rebuke to the rise of communism and the various Marxist regimes of the 20th century. Okay, so now we're up to chapters four and five, and this is really where West gets into the founders' arguments regarding the foundation and basis for natural rights theory for the state of nature uh, concept for the Lockean tradition and all of that good stuff. Again, this is persistently confusing for students. When you tell students that rights come from nature or nature's God and that governments don't give us our rights, that our rights pre-exist government, when you teach students this, they often ask, 
how can that be? How, how do they come from nature? Nature is barbaric. How does nature self-evidently infer a set of inalienable rights that individuals possess? Don't governments give us our rights? I mean, governments often have to be the thing that makes sure our rights are protected. Doesn't that mean that by protecting our rights, they are actually giving them to us? Where and how do rights emerge? And why is nature the standard for human rights? Doesn't that commit the naturalistic fallacy? Okay. Yes, these are all good questions. West argues that for the founders, when it comes to deriving rights, natural meant two things. Quote, first, that which occurs spontaneously, not as a product of human making. For example, sexual desire and reproduction. So that first definition makes sense and is pretty obvious. And then secondly, West writes, natural means, quote, a standard of right and wrong discovered by human reason based on the constant features of human nature and true for all human beings in all times and places, unquote. So this is a very confusing concept for students today, most of whom are naturally moral relativists. Now, the second definition of natural isn't so obvious. After all, most students don't believe that there is such a thing as naturally right or wrong, right? They, most people at this point in the 21st century, when you, when you actually get down to the nitty gritty and, and start debating them about um, uh, natural rights, they do not believe that there's any such thing as a discoverable objective right or wrong when it comes to the moral sphere. They do not believe that there is any such thing as uh, natural standards that we can apply to things like uh, beauty and art. So they don't, they are aesthetic relativists and moral relativists. But it's important to remember that the founding fathers here are talking about what it means when we're talking about rights, not trees or insects or wild shrubbery or noble savages, but rather what natural means in the context of rights that we as humans have that governments, when they are formed, must respect. On this point, West explains, quote, nature can denote what is by nature good or right, i.e. what people should do, not on the basis of a religious teaching or other authority imposed on them by others, but on the basis of human nature itself. This is the ground of the idea of natural right. It was first advanced by Greek philosophers around 2,500 years ago, unquote. West argues that because human individuals have natures, in other words, basic traits, characteristics, needs, propensities, and the like, because we all share characteristics that recur across all cultures and all circumstances, there will be, according to him, things that are enduringly good for them, that they ought to do. Just like food and water are always permanent natural goods for human beings by virtue of the fact that life is better than death, West says, so too are there things that are, quote, always naturally right. Here West quotes Alexander Hamilton, who writes, quote, The sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with the sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature, by the hand of divinity itself, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. In other words, natural rights are inalienable by virtue of the fact that they are what Jonathan Haidt calls anthropocentric facts. Anthropocentric facts are facts that are true given the kinds of creatures we are, given the kinds of creatures that we happen to be. All moral facts, according to Haidt, and Haidt is getting this from the philosopher David Wiggins, are anthropocentric facts. All moral facts are anthropocentric facts. That is, if we were creatures composed differently than we are, endowed with a nature that is different than ours is, creatures with needs, propensities, and desires that are different than ours happen to be, given our biological composition, given our environment, given our evolutionary history and the like, then perhaps we would not have the natural rights that we have. Natural rights rights that we have come to know via our reason. Perhaps like unself-reflective animals, if we were composed differently, we would have few to no rights given the kinds of creatures that we then happen to be. Creatures who have no ability to abstract, to use language, or even to process the idea of a right. For example, we don't save animals from being raped or murdered in the wild. In fact, we watch <laughs> uh, with relaxed awe and a bowl of popcorn on our laps as this happens routinely on the National Geographic Channel. But we are human beings, and we do possess reasoning minds, and we are rationally self-aware, self-reflective, language-wielding beings, and we possess natural rights in accordance with our nature as humans. 
Again, going back to our discussion of negative versus positive rights from our last episode, natural rights are indeed negative rights, rights that we have from being messed with, from having our freedom violated. Positive rights, like a right to health care or child care or housing or some kind of check each month that comes out of my paycheck, if you're confused about this subject, go back to last episode in which I fully describe the difference between positive rights and negative rights. Positive rights, unlike negative ones, are not natural rights. They are privileges, services, or commodities that are, as West puts it, quote, merely legal rights. According to West, quote, a legal right is granted by government and can be taken away by government. What is naturally right comes from human nature and can never be erased, no matter what laws a government may pass. It is inalienable. Now, some students here would ask, well, sure, a government can take a positive right away. They can stop giving you health care. But can't a government also take away a negative right? So that's a good question. But the answer is no, they can't. A negative right is your right by virtue of your existence. A government can violate that right. They can decide to ignore your natural human right. But unlike the so-called quote-unquote positive rights, negative rights are not material things or people or their labor or some commodity, and thus they cannot be seized. They're inherent. You come into the world with these rights. West admits that many in today's postmodern, morally relativistic society would have a hard time believing in rights that pre-exist government. Uh, I, either students are, are relativists, where, where they are saying that uh, what is right or wrong is dependent on the culture and the time, and there are no objectively uh, eternal, validly true principles of right and wrong that we have to follow. It's all dependent on the time and the moment that we're living in, right? And then I have a lot of other students who believe that there are sort of things like uh, there is objective morality, there is an objective right or wrong thing to do, but it's kind of utilitarian. It's whatever like makes the most people happy. That's the right thing to do. So it's kind of an appeal to popularity fallacy and that sort of thing. Um, those in such a camp, the camp that believes that all knowledge is socially constructed, this is a growing camp. They find not only the idea of human nature absurd, but they also find the notion that human reason can access and get at the truth to be fundamentally absurd. Those in the postmodern camp tend to believe that we are blank slates. Here West cites the postmodern thinker Richard Rorty on this point, who says that, quote, socialization and thus historical circumstance goes all the way down. There is nothing beneath socialization or prior to history that is definitory of the human. Unquote. This view is incredibly common uh, among young people today as their professors teach them essentially a postmodernized uh, version of the Rousseauian vision of the world that man in a state of nature is fundamentally good. He is a noble savage, right? Innocent, pure, free, uh, ignorantly blissful, untainted, cooperative. For Rousseau, who becomes hip again in the 1960s, it is society that begins to corrupt man. It is civilization that enslaves him. It is capitalism that destroys his spirit. Man is born free, Rousseau writes in The Social Contract, but is everywhere in chains. It is society that causes man to sin. Hobbes, on the other hand, believes that in a state of nature, our lives are, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That is because, for Hobbes, we are fallen creatures, given to sin, to greed, to selfishness, grasping, rapaciousness, licentiousness, and all manner of corruption and barbarity. For Hobbes, we are corrupt and inherently sinful. And it is only through society's mediating institutions, family, church, community organizations, the state, it is only through these mediating institutions that we are fundamentally kept in line. And so this is the point of civilization, to um, keep us in line. Life in a state of nature, according to Hobbes, is filled with violence, tribal warfare, rape, and death. What are you talking about, Rousseau? Don't you know what it's like to live in a state of nature? And so this is where natural rights theory comes in, right? Uh, so men in a state of nature, um, because it is so Hobbesian, agree to sacrifice some personal freedoms in exchange for that um, security, right? In exchange for um, protecting their 
their natural rights. Hobbes' social contract, however, gives license to an all-powerful state, the Leviathan, that's his great work, the Leviathan, uh, to protect humanity from life in a state of nature. So very different from Rousseau. Locke's social contract, on the other hand, I would say, takes the best of Hobbes and the best of Rousseau and sees the state as a servant of the people rather than a master of them. Now, why does this matter? Well, perhaps it's best here to compare Locke's ideas to the standard accepted classical and medieval tradition, which argues, to quote West, that all men are created unequal and that the wise and the virtuous ought to rule the unwise without their consent. For Plato and Aristotle, the best system of government was aristocracy, kingship, or absolute monarchy, in which rulers decide what is best for the people because they are the wisest, justest, and most virtuous. It's easy to come down hard on Plato and Aristotle here. Um, it's tempting to argue that these philosophers who were not in favor of democracy were on the, quote, wrong side of history, and that they had a cynical or pessimistic view of men. I don't think this is the case. In fact, the founders essentially agreed with their main premise. West writes, quote, In principle, the founders agreed that the best form of government is an absolute monarchy or aristocracy of the wise and good, a government of angels. They spoke cheerfully of their readiness to submit to such a government. But from the time of antiquity through the Middle Ages and into modern times, what became clear, at least to the founders, is that the argument for aristocratic or monarchical politics had proven to be wrong in theory and bad in practice. No mere human being has perfect wisdom and virtue. And more to the point, past attempts to create aristocracy or, quote, rule of the best rarely led to the rule of the wise and the virtuous. Instead, all too often, they degenerated, John Adams writes, into tyranny, cruelty, and lust. The kings, priests, ministers, and aristocrats of the Middle Ages, of course, claimed to be wise and virtuous, but they typically ruled in their own perceived self-interest. And so, in fact, Plato and Aristotle were not too cynical about human beings' ability to govern themselves. They were not cynical enough. This same sentiment is echoed by James Madison in Federalist 51 when he writes, quote, it may be a reflection on human nature that such devices, checks and balances, should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. Madison goes on to say that, quote, A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government. But experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions, unquote. Madison also discusses the way republican governments can serve as a check on the power of factions and the tyranny of the majority. Quote, in the Federal Republic of the United States, all authority in it will be derived from and dependent on the society. The society itself will be broken into so many parts, interests, and classes of citizens that the rights of the individuals or of the minority will be in little danger from interested combinations of the majority." Unquote. In any case, if we are going to leave the state of nature and form a government, we must have a government that will protect our natural rights. And this is where the founders' philosophy becomes controversial, especially today. So let's talk about how and why natural rights are objective, universal, and binding. And we'll also discuss the validity or invalidity of this Lockean state of nature um, construct or thought experiment. The state of nature is a theoretical model of mankind without government. For Locke and other state of nature philosophers, the basic task of political philosophy is to show how the rights and powers of government derive from the rights and powers of individuals in a state of nature. And here's Locke in his second treatise of government, quote, To understand political power right and derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in and that is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature, without asking leave or depending on the will of any other man. 
Individuals in a state of nature enjoy perfect freedom to dispose of their possessions and persons within limits set by the law of nature. According to Locke, although no human law governs men in a state of nature, there is a natural law of justice, a law of God, or of nature's God, discoverable by reason. Locke writes, quote, Everyone, as he is bound to preserve himself and not to quit his station willfully, so by the like reason, when his own preservation comes not in competition, ought he, as much as he can, to preserve the rest of mankind, and may not, unless it be to do justice to an offender, take away or impair the life, or what tends to the preservation of the life, liberty, health, limb, or goods of another." Unquote. And again, that was from Locke's second treatise of government. So I would say the question that logically follows is this. How then do we determine the rights that individuals should have in a state of nature? Well, to start, Locke basically maintains one self-evident truth, which is that we all, each of us, have a right to our own lives. Now, this, I think, can be broken down in two different ways. One is the God way. And here I want to point out that I'm going well beyond the book by West to explain Locke's theories. Uh, and the other way to establish a right to our own lives is the nature way. So we have the God way and the nature way. Let's start with the God way. The religious argument here um, is that we are all created in the image of God. Um, and of course, we are God's property as well. And here I'll quote Locke. The state of nature is governed by a law that creates obligations for everyone, and reason, which is that law, teaches anyone who takes the trouble to consult it that because we are all equal and independent, no one ought to harm anyone else in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. This is because, one, we are all the work of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker. Two, we are all the servants of one sovereign master, sent into the world by his order to do his business. Three, we are all the property of him who made us, and he made us to last as long as he chooses, not as long as we choose. And four, we share in one common nature, so there can't be any rank ordering that would authorize some of us to destroy others as if we were made to be used by one another as the lower kinds of creatures are made to be used by us. Everyone is obliged to preserve himself and not opt out of life willfully. So for the same reason, everyone ought, when his own survival isn't at stake, to do as much as he can to preserve the rest of mankind. And except when it's a matter of punishing an offender, no one may take away or damage anything that contributes to the preservation of someone else's life, liberty, health, limb, or goods. So... This argument makes the case that the most important right that we have, given that we are created with the divine spark, is the right to life. All other natural rights can be deduced from this God-given right. That is, we arrive at the right to liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness by deduction from this one right. All liberty flows from this original right to life. Now, you can make secular arguments for natural rights theory as well, although you do have to make the assumption without relying on a divine authority that one actually does have a right to life. And I think there are ways that you can do this. You can do this on pragmatic grounds. Uh, you could probably even use something like Kant's categorical imperative with the claim that all human beings are ends in themselves and that when one universalizes the maxim of the right to life, such a maxim does not result in a contradiction of conceivability, uh, though the absence of a right to life would. You could probably make a stretch argument and even use some kind of sophisticated um, utilitarianism, some kind of million utilitarianism by appealing to maximizing utility uh, and well-being and minimizing suffering in the long term. And so doing a kind of rule consequentialism in which uh, human life is sacred uh, although I'll admit I'm not a huge fan of utilitarian arguments, um, you probably could also use Aristotle's um, ethical theory in terms of, you know, uh, human beings having a telos, having a purpose, um, there being certain things that, fought, that can be deduced from the kinds of creatures we are and the telos that uh, we have and, and all that sort of thing. Um, Ayn Rand, even, in her book, The Virtue of Selfishness, uh, kind of gives it a shot, too. She argues, and I'm going to 
do a lengthy Ayn Rand quote here because she is particularly good uh, on, on, on this topic. A right is a moral principle defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. There is only one fundamental right. All the others are its consequences or corollaries. A man's right to his own life. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The right to life means the right to engage in self-sustaining and self-generated action, which means the freedom to take all the actions required by the nature of a rational being for the support, the furtherance, the fulfillment, and the enjoyment of his own life. Such is the meaning of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness." So I really like that passage um, because in it, Rand is making this sort of tautological argument, A equals A. The idea that to even be a human being means that it is self-evident that you have a right to life. That what it means to be human, to be an individual, to be a self, is by necessity that you are a being with a right to life. Right? What else could it mean to argue that a person is possessed of a self, that a person is a person, if that person doesn't have the, the right to life? You could make the sort of Kantian argument that there could be no such thing as a person if we abolished the right to life. Again, all rights, whether you're making the God argument or the nature argument, spring from the right to life. Rand touches on this point as well in another passage that I think is great. The the right to life, she says, means that a man has the right to support his life by his own work. It does not mean that others must provide him with the necessities of life. The right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is their only implementation. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. Since man has to sustain his life by his own effort, the man who has no right to the product of his effort has no means to sustain his life. The man who produces while others dispose of his product is a slave. So here Rand is basically making the same case that Locke has made, even though the two have very different um, philosophies. And uh, agreeing with Rand, um, among the rights which Locke claims we have in a state of nature, uh, which could be deduced from the original right to life, is, is the right to property. What Locke means here is the right to have exclusive control over and enjoyment of certain external goods, one's, quote, private property. So how does the right to property spring from the right to life? First, if all men have a right to their own life and person, then that means that all men have a natural and inalienable right to their bodies and labor power. This is commonly referred to as the right to self-ownership, though Locke uh, admittedly doesn't use that term. Um, Since slavery violates self-ownership then, it violates the law of nature, unless it is punishment imposed on someone who himself has violated that law. Again, remember that the reason libertarians and constitutional conservatives argue that taxation is theft or that taxation is slavery, as hyperbolic as that claim might sound, um, and here we're talking about taxation that doesn't serve directly to protect your natural rights, The reason that they say this is because technically taxation is slavery. I mean, look, if you have a right to your life, then of course you have a right to your labor. Everyone agrees with this, but your labor is your time and your time is your money and your money is your property. And so when the government taxes your income, if the government takes, uh, say you're a rich person and the government takes 50% of your income, that means that the government is by definition taking 50% of your labor and thus 50% of your time. And therefore, you technically spend 50% of your day working for the state for free on threat of force. And remember, it's a threat of force because the state has a monopoly on force, and any attempt to shirk the taxes they impose will in time result in punishment. First, probably fines. Then, if you don't pay those fines, you will be arrested, and then, obviously, imprisonment. So notice, as I mentioned last episode, that we've now basically met all of the necessary requirements of slavery with this arrangement. Uh, In other words, if the state can force me to labor on its behalf, it essentially asserts a property right in me. Here I'll quote the philosopher Robert Notzik from his game-changing book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. This is a book that we'll have to review at some point soon. It's a classic work uh, of libertarian thought. So Notzik writes, quote, 
Seizing the results of someone's labor is equivalent to seizing hours from him and directing him to carry on various activities. If people force you to do certain work or unrewarded work for a certain period of time, they decide what you are to do and what purposes your work is to serve apart from your decisions. This makes them a part owner of you. It gives them a property right in you, unquote. The scenario that I just mentioned, right, the inherent contradiction of that, this is why we are supposed to have property rights. Um, and remember, of course, your money is your property. Now, the next question is probably, the next question the student will ask is probably something like, well, in an original state of nature, how do I acquire the right to personal property, right? How do I acquire the right to private property? How does that work? Well, there are a couple of ways um, to do this. Locke mentions two. Um, so Locke does believe we can acquire a right to natural resources like land or minerals uh, and capital goods like factory equipment, say. Uh, one way of acquiring a right to something obviously, is by having it transferred to you via gift or consensual exchange by someone who already owns it. This is the majority of uh, transactions that take place in the market today, right? You buy something from a store, you accept a gift from someone, and then, of course, the property is transferred. But if the good in question is not already owned by anyone else, then you can, quote, appropriate it by, quote, mixing your labor with it. Appropriation of what is in the commons is something that we can do both in the state of nature and under government. And so this is kind of Locke's crowning achievement, right? This is the foundational source of um, Western property rights. Here's a quote from Jim Powell over at Fee, the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, he writes, quote, Locke established that private property is absolutely essential for liberty. And here Powell quotes Locke. Every man has a property in his own person. This nobody, literally no body, has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. He continues, The great and chief end, therefore, of men's uniting into commonwealths and putting themselves under government is the preservation of their property. That's the point of government. So Locke believed that people legitimately turned common property into private property by mixing their labor with it, thus improving it. This theory actually has a name, and it's called the labor theory of property rights. Write that down. And it holds that property originally comes about by the exertion of labor upon natural resources. So the argument basically goes as follows. One, men have a right to life and a right to their bodies. But such rights would be worthless if one didn't also have a right to procure what is absolutely necessary to stay alive, namely food. Because men have a right to themselves, they have a right to their own labor. If we needed the unanimous consent of others before we could legitimately appropriate any food or land from the commons to feed ourselves, then we would all die of starvation because it's impossible to ever get unanimous consent. Hence, the appropriation of food and land for one's exclusive private use must be legitimate. This argument infers private property rights in external goods from the right to self-ownership. Two, the right to one's labor power is a right to the value one creates by means of one's labor. If one considers anything that has been transformed by having been labored on, 99% of its value was created by the person who labored on it, while, say, 1% of its value is natural, right? Hence, the right to one's labor power implies that one owns 99% of whatever one labors on, provided it was previously unowned, of course. It might as well be a right to the whole thing. However, and here's what they call the Lockean proviso, um, one may only appropriate property in this fashion, provided there is enough and as good left in common for others. And three, and this is a final point that has uh, been the subject of a lot of debate, since labor is intrinsically or inherently unpleasant as an end in itself, and is undertaken only in expectation of enjoying the value one creates by it, it would be unjust to thwart the expectation or the enjoyment. One should enjoy private property in the good as a reward or compensation for the pain of laboring on it. To let others have the, quote, benefits of another's pains would be unjust.
So what I'd like to do now is I've, I've kind of broken down Locke's argument, but I'd like to, to read a lengthy passage, uh, bits and pieces from chapter four of the second treatise of government from Locke so that he can give you his argument in his own words, right? And remember, all of this stuff is, Locke was incredibly influential to the founding fathers. And so here's, a, here's Locke making the argument himself. The earth and everything in it is given to man for the support and comfort of their existence. All the fruits it naturally produces and the animals that it feeds, as produced by the spontaneous hand of nature, belong to mankind in common. Nobody has a basic right, a private right that excludes the rest of mankind, over any of them as they are in their natural state. But they were given for the use of men. And before they can be useful or beneficial to any particular man, there must be some way for a particular man to appropriate them. In other words, to come to own them. And because individual man has a property in his own person, meaning that he owns himself, this is something that no one else has any right to. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are strictly his. So when he takes something from the state that nature has left it in, he mixes his labor with it, thus joining to it something that is his own. And in that way, he makes it his property. He has removed the item from the common state that nature has placed it in, and through this labor, the item has had annexed to it something that excludes the common right of other men. For this labor is unquestionably the property of the laborer, so no other man can have a right to anything the labor is joined to, at least where there is enough and as good left in common for others." Unquote. So the purpose of government, the reason why we enter into the, quote, social contract that creates government is to protect our natural rights, especially our property rights. A contract becomes void if either side reneges on its terms. A government that violates our rights reneges on the contract and thus releases us from our duty to support and obey it. This is an idea that becomes enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. That is, we have a right to rebel and even overthrow a government that would violate this contract, right? Uh, That, of course, means that, quote, absolute arbitrary power claimed by absolute monarchs violates subjects' right to liberty. Further, by taxing their subjects without their consent, they violate their property rights, hence the right to revolution against absolute monarchs. Hence the claim in the Declaration of Independence that you have the right to revolution, that that you have the right to rebel against absolute monarchs. Locke's social contract theory implies then that protecting our natural rights and not violating them is a necessary condition of a government's having any legitimacy or of our having a duty to support and obey it. But it is not a sufficient condition. Because men are driven by passions as well as reason, so Locke takes a balanced approach, the temptation to violate the rights of others is always present, especially when it comes to the strong over the weak. Men in the state of nature, that is, without government, whether we're considering the state of nature as some pre-political state or one that happens to come after the dissolution of some kind of political order, while men in the state of nature are free, they are also thus at grave risk of injury and depredation. These afflictions are not only bad for individual men, they violate a moral standard which nature provides but leaves to men in a state of nature to enforce. Moreover, in the state of nature, Men can't utilize to their full potential those talents God and or nature have given them. Living well requires not merely the society of others, but also security, which requires government. Hence, men consent to government to secure their equal natural rights and to thrive within that society. Upon establishing a government, men conditionally cede some of their rights and liberty to secure the far larger remainder. For example, the state can tax men. In other words, the state can take some of men's money, right? That, that's an example of you giving up some of your rights in order so that institutions can be formed to protect their natural rights, to protect citizens from the violation of their liberties, to protect them from force, from foreign and domestic threats, from fraud, from coercion, corruption, unlawful property seizure, to enforce contracts, to keep the peace, right? Right. This is the reason that governments are formed. And this is really where the libertarian doctrine comes from. Um, Often libertarians and conservatarians and constitutional conservatives 
are accused of promoting a kind of lawless hedonism, right? They want government to be almost to the point of not existing. But this couldn't be further from the truth. What liberty lovers propose is a society of liberty under the law, in which individuals are free to pursue their own lives so long as they respect the equal rights of others. The rule of law means that individuals are governed by generally applicable and spontaneously developed legal rules, not by arbitrary command. So this comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. And that those rules should protect the freedom of individuals to pursue happiness in their own ways, not aim at any particular um, utilitarian outcome or result. This means, I would argue, that many activities of the modern state, yes, I am talking about the United States, are illegitimate, unjust, and they are violations of liberty. And so what do minimal state libertarian types want? So the minimal state libertarian theory of rights rejects three types of policies and laws that modern states commonly enact, right? This is why libertarians are always going bonkers on social media. One, uh, the first thing that libertarians typically reject are paternalistic laws. That would be laws made to protect people from harming themselves. Here, seatbelt laws are a good example of this, um, along with motorcycle helmet laws. So here I'm going to quote Michael Sandel from his fabulous book, Justice. Um, What is the right thing to do? Sandel writes, quote, even if riding a motorcycle without a helmet is reckless, and even if helmet laws save lives and prevent devastating injuries, such laws violate the right of the individual to decide what risks to assume. As long as no third parties are harmed, and as long as motorcycle riders are responsible for their own medical bills, the state has no right to dictate what risks they may take with their bodies and lives. So the second category of laws and or policies that the libertarian will reject is uh, attempts to legislate morality. And this is where I think many conservatives go off the rails and show themselves to be hypocrites. People who believe in freedom should oppose using the coercive force of law to promote notions of virtue or to express the moral convictions of the majority living in any given place and time. Um, And And so we'll just leave that there. And the third type of law um, the libertarian rejects are laws that require the redistribution of wealth or income. As we've discussed, this is coercive, uh, it's violence, and it is theft. Desirable though it may be for the affluent to support the less fortunate by subsidizing their health care or housing or education, such help should be left up to the individual to undertake, not mandated by the government. High tax rates, especially on income, reduce the incentive to work, innovate, and invest, leading to a general decline in productivity. And that list of the types of laws that libertarians um, reject on moral grounds was laid out by Michael Sandel in his book, again, Justice, What is the Right Thing to Do? Fantastic uh, uh, book. It's all about ethics. It's all about... um, Sandel is famous for his uh, philosophy course at Harvard, uh, where he teaches mainly the three foundational theories of Western ethics, the three uh, pillars of Western ethics. So uh, deontology or Kantian ethics, uh, utilitarianism, and um, uh, virtue ethics, uh, um, Aristotle's ethics. And he also uh, goes into libertarianism uh, at some length. Okay. We've paid all this lip service to what the state can't do. Okay, well, what can the state do? For Locke, the just powers of government are derived from the just powers of individuals in a state of nature. If, therefore, a government's power to punish is to be justified, Locke then has to show how one man can legitimately punish another man in a state of nature, if he's being consistent uh, with his state of nature theory. Locke writes, quote, every offense that can be committed in the state of nature may, in the state of nature, also be punished equally, and as far forth as it may, in a commonwealth, unquote. So the right to punish in a state of nature then stems from the right of every person to enforce or execute the law of nature. And here's another quote, that all men may be restrained from invading others' rights and from doing hurt to one another 
and the law of nature be observed, which willeth the peace and preservation of all mankind, the execution of the law of nature is, and the state of nature, put into every man's hands, whereby everyone has the right to punish the transgressor of that law to such a degree as may hinder its violation. And then, um, not to go into it too deeply, but Locke divides the right of punishment into two categories, and those were quite familiar with restraint and reparation, right? And those ideas kind of feed into um, theories of, you know, uh, retributive justice and restorative justice. Why, what is the point of um, punishing people? What is the point of our prison system? What are we trying to do when we put people in jail and all of that? Um, So those debates kind of spring out of this natural rights theory. Um, The thing to take away from, from, the state of nature theory on this is the idea that men do have to surrender to government their natural right to inflict just punishment personally. Throughout most of history, you have a sort of honor culture where um, people are taking justice into their own hands. If you remember, this was actually the lesson of Aeschylus's Oresteia. Just go back and listen to episode five of the Western Canon podcast where we talked about this very issue. The lesson there was that if there is to be a lasting civilization, this honor culture with a system of private vengeance must give way to public penalty, to ordered liberty, and to the rule of law. Okay, and so I thought I would end this segment by just finishing up with Thomas G. West's book uh, with his final conclusions while not giving too much away. We still want you to buy the book and read it for yourself. Um, So summing up, one of the prominent emphases in this book is the idea that men naturally differ in virtue, intelligence, and talent. This natural inequality will inevitably lead to unequal outcomes, especially when equal natural rights to use unequal talents are properly secured. Since excellence in husbandry, the arts and sciences, commerce, and many other endeavors is a boon to individual men, to society, indeed to all mankind, inequality of outcomes is welcome and just. Now, what about religion? What does Thomas G. West say about religion? In summation, West argues that the founders, far from being hostile to or dismissive of religion, tradition, and other non-rational sources of guidance for human life, the founders saw these things as not only broadly useful for political society, but fully compatible with the natural rights theory and absolutely indispensable to a political order based thereon, right? We need mediating institutions. We need a social fabric. And West would argue we need religion, right, to secure liberty and, and to pursue virtue, But the founders also agreed that religions and traditional sources of human guidance should not be authoritative for politics. In Europe, resting political legitimacy on religion led to a millennium of oligarchy and stagnation and bloody religious wars. In America, we don't tolerate having one dominant religious ideology shoved down our throats. Whose understanding of God would rule uh, in this system where we have freedom of religion, as the founders understood, and as West makes clear in his book, it is, quote, better to ground politics in a reasoned account of human nature that admits man's inability to know the mind of God and respects each person's equal natural right to follow his own conscience in matters of worship. And that's hopefully what we still have in the U.S. In the final two-thirds of West's book, the author shifts from the sort of deep Uh, theories of natural rights. Um, The author shifts from restating old arguments to blazing new trails. West um, here provides the first comprehensive account of how the founders applied natural rights principles to... So the second two-thirds of the book is West really showing how the um, 
the natural rights principles that we talked about could be applied to issues of public policy, pressing issues of public policy that we're wrestling with today. And so in part two uh, of his book, West talks about how important it is in a country where you have maximal freedom to also have virtue, morality, and uh, a strong family structure. And so how do we do that? Um, and uh, in part three of the book, West gets into uh, economics and property rights and uh, public policy issues. And so here is where you're going to need to buy the book and consume these arguments that he gives in parts two and three uh, for yourself. And so I'd like to end with a lengthy quote from Michael Anton, writing in The New Criterion, a great intellectual publication, and I would absolutely recommend you doing what I did, throwing your New Yorker in the garbage, emailing David Remnick and telling him how horrible his publication has become uh, and how far it has fallen and picking up instead a uh, subscription to The New Criterion, which is fantastic. Um, and here's a quote from Michael Anton, who is giving a review of uh, Thomas G. West's book, The Political Theory of the American Founding. And uh, this is what he had to say in his glowing review of Thomas G. West's book. Um, he says that the book will, for different reasons, quote, arouse the anger of certain sects within conservatism, but they also provide a basis for reconciliation and reunification. Libertarians will at first be annoyed by West's treatment of virtue, which they will rightly interpret as a rebuke to their wish for unlimited personal freedom. But one hopes West's account will help them come to see that the liberty they prize cannot survive absent strong families and widespread adherence to moral principle. Traditionalists will, or should, love this section, if they can get past their prejudice that any appeal to rights is destructive of the family and religion, for West shows it is not. Both should appreciate West's treatment of property. Libertarians, because West provides the strongest possible arguments for economic freedom. Traditionalists, because he makes clear not merely the moral basis, but also the moral limits of capitalism. By the time the book ends, the selfishness thesis is in ruins. West shows that the founders wished to excise from their new republic the stagnating caste system of the old world for reasons that were at once utilitarian, political, and moral. Property rights are essential to incentivizing men to industry, to the production of those goods and services without which society cannot thrive nor the higher arts and sciences emerge. A wealthy nation is also better able to defend itself and deter enemies. Widespread property ownership boosts the independent spirit of the citizenry, making men more spirited in the defense of liberty and less apt to submit to tyranny while giving them a personal stake in the success of the republic and that it is simply immoral to deny men their equal right to use their talents to the fullest. And here uh, we'll finish up with the Michael Anton quote because it's so great. In two of the book's most philosophic chapters, West explores in depth the founder's conception of virtue. He addresses the differences and commonalities between Christian and secular virtue, the proper role of spiritedness or manliness, not only in the founding but in any just society, ancient versus modern virtue, and the distinction between those ordinary virtues that must be practiced by the citizenry at large and the higher virtues that by natural necessity will only appear in some. For those who can move beyond the laughter, consider that the three pillars of the Founders' political theory are consent, the social compact, the securing of equal natural rights, government's sole just function, and safety and happiness, the ends for which government exists. In other words, to protect the people from dangers, foreign and domestic, so that they may freely and happily enjoy their equal natural rights. So again, that there was a quote from Michael Anton's review of the book. All right, so that is it for this episode number two of the Liberty Lounge. Next episode, we will be doing the first part in a review of Jonah Goldberg's 2018 book, The Suicide of the West, how the rebirth of nationalism, populism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy. So that will be episode number three. 
That book is fantastic and totally relevant. It's about freedom, classical liberalism, and all that good stuff. So you should buy that book so you can read it alongside of this podcast uh, for episode number three. Tune in to episode number 10 of the Western Canon Podcast coming out in a couple of weeks here. And that episode will be exploring some of the great ideas of Plato's Republic. In the meantime, thanks for listening and happy reading. (laughs) 